Good afternoon on today's Angry Alien Bulletin. Perhaps the most commonly described characteristic of any flying saucer, any UAP, any UFO is the capability to hover and maneuver with no visible form of propulsion, with no heat signature, no sound of jet turbines, no nothing. Just the ability to maneuver pretty much any damn way they please without having to adhere to the laws of physics, to natural laws that all of us are very familiar with. But is this really the case? Is it possible for this kind of propulsion system to actually exist within our own understanding of the laws of physics? Well, a former NASA engineer has unveiled what may be a revolutionary new form of propulsion, which would explain everything that UFOs have been doing in our atmosphere. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again, welcome to the latest Angry Alien Bulletin. This is actually the second episode in our Alien Week. And this is something that I've had a tradition of doing, usually once a year. However, UFO and alien content has become substantially more popular on my channel since then. So as all of you probably know, I've been releasing that sort of content with a little bit more regularity. Um, certainly the majority of the content I release is still space flight, space science oriented, etc. And not UFO UAP type content, but still been releasing a lot more of it because it is clear that this is what the viewers want. You guys really enjoy that content and I can't blame you. I enjoy it too. The whole idea that we are not alone in the universe and there may be evidence to this effect and that we can observe actually fairly easily and seems to be coming more and more apparent to us all the time. Well, that's very compelling stuff and definitely newsworthy as far as I'm concerned, as long as it's coming from a relatively reliable source. I try to be very specific and very detailed about what I talk about on this channel. Channel. But nevertheless, um, pretty exciting, and I hope you guys enjoy this particular week. So one particular topic that I think is worth talking about is alien propulsion, and I bring it up on a regular basis, UFO propulsion, whatever you want to call it, all of the claims that somehow UFOs perform maneuvers that defy the laws of physics. I actually don't like that term. I don't like the idea that any technology that we're observing is simply ignoring the natural laws of the universe that we well understand and laws of the universe that we observe in action all the time with the behavior of other astronomical objects, the behavior of black holes, of planets orbiting their suns, all of these things adhere to certain natural laws that we know to be constant and to think that somehow technology, through technology or through some sort of incredibly advanced civilization, there are species in the universe who can simply ignore that, simply cast those natural laws aside. Well, I don't know how compelling I find that, actually. It makes the whole story a little less credible to me. Instead, what I like to see is feasible alternative propulsion methods that we can understand, that we can theorize about, that we can experiment with, that could perhaps produce some of the maneuvers, some of the behavior observed in the UAP that have been spotted in our skies by a wide variety of credible witnesses, including military pilots who know a hell of a lot about what aircraft can do in our atmosphere. And now, a very interesting form of propulsion, something called the Exodus Drive, was just unveiled by a NASA engineer, presented to a wide variety of extremely experienced engineers and scientists for their 
consideration to see whether or not they can poke any holes in this propulsion system to see whether or not it is legitimate but it is an amazing innovation if indeed this is true and that is a new type of propulsion system that doesn't require propellant in order to gain velocity something that apparently is capable of escaping Earth's gravity, of overcoming the force of Earth's gravity, which is very significant, by the way. It's something that makes it very difficult for us to leave our own planet without a hell of a lot of rocket fuel. And yet this is a system that seems to be able to escape our gravity without any propellant whatsoever. Instead, utilizing pure electric power and the pressure of electrostatic forces in order to produce momentum. And if this is indeed true, we could be traveling between the stars before the end of the century. This could also explain how and why we are being visited by other species that may be doing the same thing. So the Exodus Drive is the brainchild of one Dr. Charles Bueller, who used to be NASA's subject matter expert on electrostatics. So a guy who knows quite a lot about this type of technology and the science associated with it. But let me tell you, it's going to be a little difficult to try to explain this to the layman. And I have to admit, I don't really understand a lot of it either, but it does sound pretty damned amazing. I'm just going to go ahead and read the patent that was submitted on the Exodus Drive and try to interpret what it actually does. But here we go, quote, a system and method for generating a force from a voltage difference applied across at least one electrically conductive surface. The applied voltage difference creates an electric field resulting in an electrostatic pressure force acting on at least one surface of an object. Asymmetries in the resulting electrostatic pressure force results in a net electrostatic pressure force acting on the object. So the asymmetry of the electromagnetic field or electrostatic field apparently applies a pressure to one side of an object which results in it being pushed forward. At least that's how I'm interpreting that this works. The magnitude of the net resulting electrostatic pressure force is a function of the geometry of the electrically conducive surfaces, the applied voltage, and the dielectric constant of any material present in the gap between electrodes. What I find to be interesting about this is the geometry of the electrically conductive surfaces. I'd be interested to see what particular shapes result in a greater electrostatic force being applied. Does a saucer, or does a sphere, or does a cylinder produce a better result, or does it require some other type of configuration? So far, we don't have any details on that. The invention may be produced on a nanoscale using nanostructures such as carbon nanotubes. We're of course not very interested in that, but it can also be utilized to provide a motivating force to an object. A case example is the use of electrostatic pressure force apparatus as a thruster to propel a spacecraft through a vacuum. So we're talking about a propulsion system that requires no propellant. It just requires electrical energy and it has to be configured or shaped in a certain way in order to produce this asymmetrical force that results in a forward momentum or forward thrust. Now, these are the different aspects or the different components of this invention or what is required according to the patent. First of all, you need an apparatus for generating a force on an object and it's comprised of an object with one electrode, at least one electrode, having at least one electrically conductive surface. 
wherein at least one voltage is applied to said at least one electrically conductive surface, and wherein the application of said at least one voltage to said at least one electrically conductive surface generates an electric field, giving rise to an electrostatic pressure acting on or at least one surface of said object, thereby generating an electrostatic pressure force on said at least one surface. Okay, so what does all that crap mean? Well, it just means that you have to have an electrically conductive surface and at least one electrode. You generate an electrostatic field by running a current through it, and the nature of that field, the asymmetrical aspects of that field, generate a pressure on one side of the object pushing it forward. And said electrostatic pressure force is characterized by a net resulting electrostatic pressure force acting on said object. Now, two, that was only number one. And I'm going to start paraphrasing at this point before I lose my entire audience here. You need to have all the electrostatic pressure forces acting along an axis. In other words, all of them being applied in the same direction. I mean, that kind of goes without saying, I would think. Now, the key is the shape and geometric arrangement of the conductive surfaces and the value of at least one voltage are each defined by computational methods to achieve a desired net resulting electrostatic pressure force. Apparently, assuming that these engineers are being truthful here, they have determined or unlocked the key of arranging these conductive surfaces and the electrostatic field in just such a way to achieve the maximum amount of thrust in one given direction, enough thrust to overcome the force of gravity. So the apparatus of generating the force is also comprised of an object that has a plurality of electrically conductive surfaces, each of said electrically conductive surfaces attached to one another by a non-electrically conductive structure. So that seems to be an important part of it is you also need non-conductive pieces of this structure in order to make it all work. And the voltage is applied to two or more of said electrically conductive surfaces, each of said surfaces receiving a different voltage, thus creating a voltage difference between the conductive surfaces, wherein the voltage difference generates an electric field, giving rise to an electrostatic pressure on at least one surface of said object, thereby generating an electrostatic pressure force on at least one surface. We get the idea. The objective is all the same. You want an electrostatic pressure force being applied to one surface to push the object in one given direction. And apparently, the engineers who created this innovative thruster have unlocked all of the different configurations and electrostatic forces that are necessary to achieve the desired result. And they've actually gone through the various steps that are necessary in order to build one of these thrusters. And it's kind of vague, but what they do is they define the geometric arrangement of every electrically conductive surface, then determine a value for at least one voltage, determine the resulting electric field intensity at each point along the electrically conductive surfaces, then they determine the resulting electrostatic pressure force acting on the surfaces of said object, and apparently the result of this carefully crafted electrostatic static field and carefully crafted object results in thrust in a given direction sufficient to overcome the force of gravity. And apparently there's also some history to all of this. This is not something they pulled out of thin air. Experiments have been done on this type of propulsion in the past. Quote, the notion of using electric fields as a method of propulsion was previously explored as far back as the 1920s. American inventor Thomas Townsend Brown discovered that a force was developed on a Coolidge tube when the tube was subjected to high voltage. His electric field force effect is an electrical phenomenon which employs an electrical field for generating applied forces, which could be used, for example, to motivate a spacecraft without exhausting propellant. By the way, when you have a look at Thomas Brown's illustrations for what he had in mind for a spaceship that would be driven by these types of forces, well, have a look. 
Thomas Brown's engineering drawings are quite literally a gallery of flying saucers. It was created decades before flying saucers really became a thing in American popular culture. And as disclosed in one of his patents, he utilized what's called an electrokinetic phenomenon, electrical energy being converted to mechanical energy, which is then used to provide a force for providing movement to a structure. There were several patents describing propellantless propulsion devices based on this effect, coined the Beefield Brown Effect, named after Mr. Brown and his graduate school advisor, Dr. Paul Alfred Beefield. Now, apparently in the late 1980s, Robert Talley of Veritel Technology performed a test in vacuum of this type of technology. He suspended a sphere disc from a suspension wire and measured torsion forces on it. This gave him the sensitivity to be able to measure small forces. The lengthy report is one of only two written on this effect, describing the measurement of a force while in a vacuum chamber. He ultimately attributed that force that he observed to the electrostatic interaction between the chamber and the device. In the decades that followed, NASA did a fair amount of follow-up work on his research, trying to unlock the secret of this type of propulsion, but it was ultimately given up. But Dr. Bueller continued the work and apparently has made a substantial breakthrough. But in order to prove this, it has to go up on a SpaceX rideshare mission and actually get tested in outer space, which will require only about a million dollars worth of investment. And given the potential benefits that this could bring to modern space flight and a wide variety of other technologies, well, I think it's well worth it to see whether or not this is something that's actually legitimate. Because what if you could actually generate a sustained full G-force worth of thrust over a long period of time? You wouldn't be restricted by a finite amount of propellant. Rather, if you just had an ongoing source of power through a fusion reactor, perhaps a conventional fission reactor might be enough. But let's take this technology to its furthest extreme. Let's say you had a matter-antimatter -matter reactor and a Bussard ramjet, which would continue to gather up material between the stars so that you would have an ongoing supply of fuel for your reactor. Again, highly theoretical, but let's say you could do that and you could keep providing electrical power to this thruster indefinitely. If you did that and continue to accelerate at 1G, you could reach the center of the galaxy in 12 years. How is that possible? Well, as I've mentioned a number of times on this channel, funny things start to happen when you get close to the speed of light. Time travels more and more slowly the more you approach that magic speed 300,000 kilometers per second. You can never actually reach it. It requires more and more energy to traverse those final few fractions of a percentage of the speed of light, but the closer you get to it, the slower time passes for you. Not for the people you left behind, you would never see them again, but as far as the time that elapses on your ship, you would reach the center of the galaxy in a mere 12 years. You could reach the end of the universe in a single human lifetime. And with that kind of capability at your disposal, why not travel to nearby stars and check out promising planets like ours? Thank you very much for watching. I'd like to thank Jonathan Cattell and also Drew, my latest Patreon supporters. Thank you so much. We are slowly but surely climbing this hill to reach 1% of my subscriber base being Patreon supporters, which will unlock so many opportunities for this channel to really do some incredible content for you folks. Thank you so much for supporting that. And if you'd like to join these folks and get access to early release content and exclusive content, 
content and my discord server well all of the details are in the description so until we confirm that this amazing breakthrough propulsion is indeed a thing which will revolutionize the future of space travel and perhaps the future of human civilization i urge all of you to stay angry about space <laughs>